A recently published study showed greater weight loss with an app-based ketogenic diet approach compared to Weight Watchers approach. And it wasn't even close. It was quite significant uh, with the keto group losing 8.3 kilograms in 24 weeks versus only 2.8 kilograms on Weight Watchers. So does this prove low carb is better? Does this prove that there's a metabolic advantage to eating low carb? Well, I'm going to give you my perspective, and we're going to hear from one of the authors, Dr. Ethan Weiss. I'm Dr. Brett Scher, the medical director of dietdoctor.com, and it's actually a pleasure to be able to uh, talk to Dr. Weiss about this. But first, let's talk about the trial a little bit. So I'll give you some of those perspectives. First, it was published in Obesity, and they had 155 patients who were overweight with a body mass index between 27 and 43. And this was a completely app-based trial. There was very little, if any, human interaction. Uh, and we'll hear Dr. Weiss talk about that as well. And it w they were randomized to the standard Weight Watchers, um, the app-based Weight Watchers approach, counting your calories, you know, assigning point values, or they were assigned to a keto, K-E-Y-T-O, which is the brand which Dr. Weiss is a co-founder in, um, to be clear, uh, to their program with their breath sensor. And what they did was they, they followed them for 48 weeks. And so we're going to eventually get the 48 week data, but so far we have the 12 and the 24 week data. And at 12 weeks, the people following the, the low carb keto app lost 5.6 kilograms, whereas Weight Watchers, they lost 2.5 kilograms. And at 24 weeks, it was 8.3 kilograms for the low carb versus 2.8 kilograms for Weight Watchers. So significant, significant difference. And those following the low carb approach improved their hemoglobin A1C and liver function test ALT, whereas the Weight Watchers group did not. Now, here's the other interesting thing. Both groups reduced their calories. And statistically, they reduced it to the same amount. But it was self-reported data, as you're going to hear Dr. Weiss talk about, that maybe that's an issue. But if you take it at face value, that they ate the same amount of calories with significant difference in weight loss, that speaks to a metabolic advantage for low-carb nutrition, meaning there's something about eating low-carb that helps you lose more weight. And that's part of the carbohydrate-insulin model of obesity that we've talked to um, Dr. David Ludwig about and, of course, others. Um, and there is some evidence to support that, but it's not universally accepted. There's lots of controversy about it. So what are some of the other potential explanations? Well, we're going to hear Dr. Weiss's theory that maybe it has to do with the, the poor um, quality of self-reported data, which, which is hard to argue with, but why would it be one instead of the other? So we'll hear what he has to say about that. But basically, I think this was a, a big victory for science, right? It was, it was a randomized control trial. It was app-based. It was not very expensive to run. Um, it didn't require a lot of human intervention, and it showed a significant difference um, measuring weight loss hemoglobin and A1C, it was impactful on the lives of these people, and it contributes to, to the uh, body of evidence. Now, it's not a mechanistic study, right? We can have mechanistic studies, which are highly controlled studies in metabolic wards. They have their own problem. Uh, compliance doesn't factor in because everything's provided. Time frame is very short. So if something takes longer to adjust, like to a low-carb diet adaptation, you might be missing that or not measuring it. But the positives of this, it's a real life study. I mean, this is something any dietitian, any physician, any health coach can do. Just put somebody on a ketogenic diet, give them the advice to do it, and maybe give them some support with an app or even like a website like dietdoctor.com where they can get the information and get started and then not have so much uh, hands-on intervention. That's the real world study. And this showed good compliance and good outcomes. So, so pretty impressive study. But now the most exciting, let's hear what Dr. Weiss has to say about this study since he was involved in, and knows the literature well. All right. Well, Dr. Weiss, thanks for coming back on to talk about this exciting new study that you just have published. Yeah. Thanks for having me back, Brett. Yeah. So congratulations on the study. Very, very interesting study in so many different ways. And I think the first one to talk about was this study really had very little human interaction. It was just all over an app, all remote. Um, and it was designed that way even before COVID. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, we, uh, I don't know if you want to say we got lucky or, uh, I don't know. I don't think we were that smart. We probably just got lucky. <laughs> yeah. Which is, which is actually a really good point because when you talk about lifestyle intervention studies, you know, the big question is who's funding it because pharmaceutical companies aren't funding it. So you kind of do have to do these studies on the cheap. You're almost at like a disadvantage, right? That's right. This study, just so to be clear and transparent, this study was funded, well, it was funded jointly by this company that I co-founded and advised called Keto Health. 
uh, and then also by the Canadian government. The Canadian government has a spectacular program for funding industry-sponsored research for uh, Canadian scientists. So, Well, it's a whole other topic we can get into about how the U.S. can learn from that. Maybe that's yeah. another topic we'll discuss. But but let's get into some of the details of the study. So so basically using the app that, that you helped fund the company, the Keto app, or using the Weight Watchers app, and really no other no other advice, no other intervention, or, or was there? Very light. I mean, there was an onboarding call that everybody got, uh, but very little, like, yeah, I mean, I think there might have been, like, I, I actually don't even know what was available to people in the Weight Watchers app. I think there we did pay for their version of premium, which would have allowed them to chat with a coach if they wanted to, but we don't have any way of tracking that. Uh, and on the keto side, there were like one or two chats and that was it. Okay. So yeah, really hands off yep. and, and just saying, here's the advice, go for it. And some pretty dramatic results. I mean, uh, at 12 weeks, the people on the keto app had lost 5.6 kilograms versus 2.5 on Weight Watchers. So right away, 12 weeks, pretty significant benefit. But then at 24 weeks, it continued to improve on the keto app. They lost 8.3 kilograms. And the Weight Watchers really kind of stalled at 2.8 kilograms. So I guess my first question is, were you surprised to see this? Or did you think all along that was your hypothesis? No, I, we were surprised. I mean, uh, yeah. we, I mean, I think we had an idea that a low-carb intervention might be, uh, might have advantages for weight loss over a sort of more conventional low-fat you know, diet like approach, like a Weight Watchers approach. But we didn't know if people were going to be able to do this on their own. And mm -hmm. I think that was sort of the, one of the big questions that we sought to answer. Yeah. So, you know, there's this big debate about low carb diets. Does it give, does it provide a metabolic advantage uh, beyond other diets or is it simply because it helps you reduce calories more? And one interpretation of your study could be, well, look, the calorie consumption was roughly the same between the two diet groups. So therefore, it must be a metabolic advantage. That's one interpretation, but I don't think that's your interpretation from what I've seen. So I'm curious to hear your take on it. Uh, yeah, so this is definitely one of the most interesting and I think um, thought-stimulating parts of the results that we got, which is, as you say, the self-reported uh, analysis that we did of, of calorie intake, energy intake over the course of the study showed that there was no difference or if anything, people randomized to the keto intervention got ate more or said they ate more. Uh, and yes, you can interpret that at least two ways, probably a lot, a lot more. One simple way is, yeah, there's a metabolic advantage to doing this and that they end up burning more calories. Uh, I think that's possible. I can't prove that it's not. I just happened, if I were to be betting, I would bet that it's something else. And I think I uh, love having you know, sort of interesting conversations where we get to debate things, especially when no one knows the answer. And so I, you know, sort of intentionally threw this out there that I had a hunch that it might be something else. Well, you're going to keep us in suspense? What are your oh, something yeah, else no, theories? I don't think, I mean, again, I, I think, you know, um, we can argue or discuss forever and ever about the sort of how do you lose weight? How do you gain weight? Is it purely just an increase in calories? Are we just glorified automobiles? Uh, or is there something else? And, uh, I guess, you know, in, from the way I look at this, uh, I guess ultimately, this is going to sound kind of bad, don't really care because it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, people lost an enormous amount of weight and, um, and they were able to do so relatively easily. And it was really a tremendous amount of weight relative to the control. And, you know, again, this was not just control diet as usual or hand somebody a pamphlet and pat them on the back. This was an right. active well-known, well-vetted consumer weight loss program. So the, it is really important that we decided to randomize not to just control or placebo or nothing. We did a randomized trial against a real control arm, a real active control arm. So, um, you know, I think what, uh, you know, how and why this worked the way it worked is, is fascinating. Again, my hunch is, and it's just a hunch, is that people doing this low-carb intervention felt like they were more full. And there has been some work to show that uh, people doing low-carb uh, nutrition do have sort of a, uh, uh, well, two things. One is they, they do uh, feel more full when calorie-restricted. That's an important distinction from like, uh, the work that Kevin Hall just published 
which is a very different context where people weren't calorie, they were not losing weight and they were not calorie restricted. And then the other thing that's interesting is that, and this is also work from Kevin's group, is that people doing low carb interventions tend to over report how much they eat, meaning they say they eat more than they did. And my guess, and it's just a guess, or I should say it's just a um, in, informed guess, is that that's because they feel more full. They're not as hungry. So if you're not as hungry, you think, well, I must have eaten more. So my guess is that they actually did not eat the same number of calories, that if we had a way of tracking actually what they did eat, that we would see that they ate a lot more than they thought they did, or sorry, a lot less than they thought they did. Yeah, a, co a couple of really good points there. And, and that last one you made, that's the difference between a here's your advice and go kind of trial versus let's put you in the metabolic ward and measure everything you eat kind of trial. And the metabolic ward is good for physiology as long as you give it enough time and measure the right variables. And the here you go, good luck trial is very good for the clinician out there to know how their patients are going to respond. So this is this type of trial, like you said, who cares why it works? It works. Docs go use it. You know, nutritionists go use it. That could certainly be one interpretation. And But the other really important thing you brought up is that there's an active control arm. And I think that's so important because so many of these trials show X diet works better than the standard American diet. Well, what isn't going to work better than the standard American diet is a common retort. So, so having the active arm um, is really important here, and not not an exactly a good advertisement for Weight Watchers, that's for sure, huh? Well, uh, I mean, you know what you get with Weight Weight Watchers. This is part of the reason we chose them. There's a tremendous wealth of published results using Weight Watchers in different randomized nutrition trials. So, uh, the amount of weight that we saw in our participants. A 12 and eight and 16 weeks, or sorry, 12 and 24 weeks was relatively close to what the average weight loss is in all the published trials. So um, I don't think, again, I'm not intentionally trying to troll Weight Watchers. I think you know what you get with Weight Watchers. Um, yeah. So we knew roughly what we were going to get about, you know, over 12 weeks, you get about three kilograms. And yeah. uh, so we knew that was the bar. And honestly, you know, when we were designing the study, in our heads, even though we didn't design it this way, it was really, to me, an inferiority trial, right? Like, could you actually, uh, not inferior, sorry, non-inferiority trial, could you actually show that you could do as well? Um, again, we didn't intend, we didn't design it that way. We designed it as a superiority trial, but, but I wasn't expecting to do the way it, to do as well as we did. I think we were all surprised. Yeah. Yeah, and that's interesting. But and also, let's talk about the the carbohydrates because the sort of like the the design of the intervention was to use the breath meter mm -hmm. to titrate your amount of carbohydrates to stay in like the moderate level, which yep. according to the breath meter was like a four or above. But Correct. even with that intervention and using the breath meter three times per day, the carb reduction wasn't of the you know 30 grams per day like we see in a lot of the ketogenic trials it was 90 grams per day so were you also surprised by that data well yes and no again it all comes back to how much weight you put into these self-reported nutrition surveys and this goes back okay. to what i was saying before i think they're notoriously pretty dirty and we all know that right i mean this is not yeah. rocket science people are terrible at reporting what they eat so you could say well why didn't we do it we didn't do it for treat and we didn't do it because we were like, what's the point? It's a random number generator. Here we were actually interested in trying to compare the difference between the two groups. I'm really happy we did it. I don't think people ate 90 grams of carbohydrate a day. I don't think they ate 30, though. I think they probably ate more. Importantly, we, we don't really know. Um, but my guess is they ate a lot more than 30 and a lot less than 90. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And it, it brings up a lot of the frustrations with self-reported data um, for all those trials that are out there. I mean, you kind of do have to throw your hands up in the air and say, well, it's the best guess that, that we sort of have or they have, but it's likely not accurate. So do you think there's utility at all for a study like this to say, to start talking about mechanisms, to start talking about physiology or not? E don't even scratch the surface. Just keep it no. as a pure practical trial. I mean, you can... You can interpret it however you want to interpret it. I sort of think, look, let's, you know, if you want to be a purist, you'll, you know, think about it in the context of what was our primary endpoint, what were some of the secondaries, and stick to that. If you're curious and inquisitive and you can frame it correctly and not over interpret it and over, you know, sort of index on what it all means, I think it's fun yeah. to speculate about what's going on. So I, I love, you know, especially because it could be a launching point for future studies. So yeah, I, I don't mind at all. I think it's great that people 
dig in and try and think a little bit about what all this stuff means. And there are lots of interesting questions. And by the way, like lots more to come, including the one-year data, which should be out sometime, you know, late fall or early next year. And then lots of different sort of sub-analyses. Again, nothing that we would, you know, sort of make primary, you know, this is going to end up in a major, major journal, but some really interesting exploratory things that we're doing, trying to understand sort of how did this work and how, what are the behavioral um, implications and what is the impact of mm -hmm. this device? Does this device actually do anything? Um, what predicts success? Right. It would be interesting to see the app use without the device versus the app use with the device to see that, that feedback, that constant feedback and how much that helps with compliance. Cause at the one year data, it seems like it's a foregone conclusion. It's going to be better as long as they remain compliant, I would think, right? So it's more of a compliance measure almost at that point. Um, so that will be interesting yeah, to see. I think, I think so. I mean, I guess, you know, just to be totally transparent, I'm not sure how much the device will matter at one year. I think the device is probably really important early on as a learning tool and yeah. as in re reinforcing some of these behaviors. I think by six months and definitely by one year that at least in my own experience and talking to people of mine who've done this before, pe friends of mine who've done this before, that it's pretty well baked at that point. Like, uh, you know, you don't need a lot of the information you're getting from the device. Yeah, that's a good point. It can be very helpful feedback in the beginning as you learn the tools and techniques and the behaviors and the recipes and whatnot. But then once you get it ironed out, not as important. Yeah. Well, well some of the other interesting data was the hemoglobin A1C went down in the keto group, but not the Weight Watchers group. ALT, measure of liver function, improved in the keto group, but not the Weight Watchers group. Do you think that was a, a factor of weight loss pure and simple? Or do you think, again, you know, brainstorming potential hypothesis mechanisms, did the carb reduction have something to do with that in addition to weight loss? Yeah, this one we did actually explore in the manuscript. And I think you raise a great point, right? So we all know that weight loss will improve those metabolic markers like hemoglobin A1C or you know, ALT, which is a marker of liver, of metabolic liver disease. I think, um, the, uh, the advantage of doing an active comparator is that we had weight loss in the control group and, or in the other group, you can't even call it a control group, right? It's not really in the right. other group. And so we were able to do some very exploratory analyses to ask that very important question is, were these changes in metabolic markers all due to weight loss or were they due to potentially something else? And so we were, went back and uh, the, I should say that the graduate student who led this work is an incredibly talented young woman whose first name is Kaya, and I can't pronounce her last name for the life of me because it's like Falkanian, but it's some German name. And she works in the lab of John Little, and John's a phenomenally talented young scientist in, um, in Kelowna, British Columbia, who was the PI on this study. So I wasn't the PI. And Kaya went back and, and did an analysis where she basically adjusted for weight loss and then looked to see what the impact was on changes in hemoglobin A1C and on ALT specifically. And she saw that those changes remained significantly different between the two groups, even when you adjust for the amount of weight lost. So it does give us a hint that there may well be something else going on, which, by the way, it doesn't take a mathematician or a statistician to know. As you said, there was no change in hemoglobin A1C in the Weight Watchers group, despite the fact that they lost three kilograms or so of weight. So... I think it starts to tell you that there is probably here something special and different about the diet. Yeah. I guess the counter, the counter argument would be that there's some threshold level that you have to get above, but again, you know, some threshold level of weight loss to get above, to see the metabolic benefits. But again, as hypothesis, I guess we don't know that for sure. Maybe so. I don't have, we didn't obviously publish this, but I've been able to kind of dig in and do a deep dive on all the individual level data. And, you know, we've looked specifically at each person in the trial and we, so we've graphed people by how much weight that, that you know we sort of done before and after and i will tell you at least as far as i can see it's not there's no threshold because there were some people if you look at the waterfall plots in the weight watchers group who lost a s significant amount of weight i, I don't yeah. remember the max but they did lose a significant amount of weight but it doesn't appear that that led to the same or even close to the same improvements in these metabolic markers yeah i think that's the most interesting data for the metabolic the metabolic benefit of the carb reduction that you can compare those who had the biggest, um, the biggest response. And those waterfall plots are fascinating when you look at your at the study. I mean, it, really, the inflection point has really just shifted so far over for the keto group. But there, there's some on both sides as there are for for any trial. Yeah, so I thought that was a good visual representation. I re recommend people sit, uh, take a look at that. Yeah. So, what do you think this adds to the literature for for um, 
low carb intervention. Um, yeah, low carb intervention, I guess. Let's just leave it at that. Well, so I think we've talked about a couple of the things. We've talked about sort of this was mostly or almost actually entirely mobile delivered during mm-hmm. a pandemic, which is pretty amazing, right? I mean, we started enrollment for this trial in, I believe, either late December, early January of 2020. And we were peak enrolling in March, April, May of 2020 during lockdown. And so uh, people were able to do it. Uh, we were able to replace a lot of the human intervention that you find in a program like Verda, right? I mean, Verda is a very human heavy intervention. We were able right. to see results that were not that far off from what they've published. Now they've not done a randomized trial. They've done single arm studies or, you know, against some uh, sort of usual care, obviously a different population of people. They do have a smaller group of, um, of people with prediabetes, but, uh, but we were able to deliver a pretty robust result without, you know, without that human component. And uh, so that's one. Number two, I think, you know, we talked a little bit about the sort of question about the relative impact of, uh, or the question about calories versus, you know, metabolic benefit. I think that's interesting. Um, Number three, we've talked about these metabolic benefits themselves. So the hemoglobin A1C and the ALT. The only thing that we haven't talked about, the other kind of key take home that I had as a cardiologist that you're going to know before I even say it, is that we had designed this study specifically to try to offset some of the reported effects of low carbohydrate diets on lipids. And so we designed a relative, a diet that was sort of emphasizing mono and polyunsaturated fats and sort of emphasizing less saturated fat, particularly from animals. And so our yeah. program was sort of designed to ask the question, can you do this diet, get all the benefits and not see any of the changes in the lipids that concern you know, me? and I won't speak for you, but concern, let's say, most cardiologists. And so that was exciting. Even though it was a negative result, uh, there was no change, no difference, statistical difference in the lipids between the two groups. So again, it shows that you can kind of get all of this good stuff. And the one thing that sort of has always kept me up at night is, are we creating a mess with with these lipids? And again, we just didn't see it. Yeah, and and that part I find so interesting because I wonder... Like you and I come from a very different perspective, I think, because we don't see patients who start a keto diet and have perfectly normal LDL. They just, they just don't come to see us. We kind of only see the ones um, where they have their LDL goes to the roof and, and nobody knows what to do. So they send them to a cardiologist and a cardiologist who's aware of a keto diet. So I think we, we certainly have um, a, a referral bias based on that. But when you look at the data, certainly the Verta Health data and some uh, meta-analyses of, of randomized controlled trials of low-carb studies, in patients who are obese or have type 2 diabetes, the majority of them don't have the LDL rise. Most of those studies show that on average, the LDL or ApoB does not go up. So I'm wondering if that really is a problem that needs to be addressed in the literature in that patient population. Okay, great point and great question. I think in uh, and it's a little bit hard because you know uh, it's a mishmash of studies, as you say. I think the Verda data is probably the cleanest data set. Different, a little bit of a different different patient population because they're mostly patients with type two diabetes, and ours didn't have that. But um, if I recall correctly, and I haven't looked at it in a long time, there was about a ten percent increase in LDL cholesterol in in the Verda study, at least at one year. About there was a 10%, 10% LDL increase without an increase in ApoB, interestingly. Yeah, which is interesting. Um, and again, I'm not sure that matters, but I mean, I think, you know, I'm a, as you know, I'm an ApoB guy, so I'm, and I was comforted by that. Um, uh, so on average, and I don't have ind- data, access to the individual data in the Verda trial, but we don't know if there were some individuals who had, you know, substantial rises. Uh, but on average, there was sort of this modest increase in LDL. And as you say, no change in ApoB, which is comforting. Uh, we didn't see any change in, in LDL or ApoB or anything. And actually, I do have access to individual level data and we've plotted them. And there were really no what anyone would call hyper responders here. So no one's LDL. So a few people is, uh, did have increases in LDL cholesterol, but nothing. I don't think anyone ended up over. I'm just making this up, but I think I don't think anyone ended up over 190. I mean, I would be. I'm comfortable. I think saying that I don't think anyone ended up over 190. Uh, yeah, and the majority yeah. of people stayed the same or went down. So yeah, so it would be interesting to test this in people who are hyper responders. 
have half of them yes. keep doing what they're doing and switch half yes. of them. Yes. Any plans for that in the future? I'd love to do that. Uh, it, it's been, it's on a list of short list of studies that we hope to do. I, uh, I think it would be really fun. I have an anecdotal experience. I'm sure you do too, playing around with, yeah. as you say, patients who come to me with this problem and how to fix it. And obviously, you know, there are multiple ways to do that, including making changes in their nutrition, but also, you know, potentially adding medicines. Um, anecdotally, I've had a lot of success with, with doing that, you know, swap fat swap of increasing mm -hmm. the on mono and polyunsaturated fats and reducing saturated fat. Um, yeah. but that's not a study. So, but right. overall, I think it was, um, a comfort, you know, you know, sort of really well done and I'm patting John on the back, not necessarily us, but a well done study, relatively decent length of time. We'll see the one year data and active comparator and, you know, Again, nothing here that screams to people out there who are really worried about cholesterol. Uh, it, there's nothing here that says this is something to worry about. I think we can say you, you can do this. And that one concern that sort of lingers in a lot of mainstream doctors and cardiologists' mind is what's the impact on lipids. We can say pretty yeah. safely, look, you can get this benefit, but you, you're not going to see that problem. Yeah, such a great point. I mean, so many people are hesitant to recommend a low-carb or keto diet simply because of the what ifs and this study shows you can do it without any what ifs really and that's that's pretty remarkable yeah i mean i guess formally we don't have outcomes but it, it is no one does in any of these studies so yeah. I, all the markers the surrogates all go in the right direction i mean i used to say when i advised verda back in the day i used to say look you get 35 markers and 34 of them go in the right direction and one doesn't i think here we can say we get all of them going in the right direction great well, uh, congratulations for you and your team um, for, for getting this out there. And thank you for contributing to quality studies in the, in the field of ketosis and carbohydrate reduction. And I look for, look for more from you in the future. It's good. I think, uh, you know, we got, like I said, we got more coming. It'll be fun to see what everything looks like. And um, I'm glad people are interested. Very good. All right. Thanks again.